Hello, welcome to Nine Lessons of Carols for Curious People. I'm Robin Ince. Uh, welcome back if you've watched some of the other things we put up uh, from this 24 stroke, 25 hour show. Many different things, including Tim Minchin and Robert Smith and Brian Cox and Helen Sharman and Samantha Cristoforetti. It's all up there and out there, or maybe it's not quite yet. This might have come out a little bit before. But anyway, keep looking and eventually you will find those things because they will be available for you. Uh, now, the next section uh, is uh, what well, is it? It includes, there was a half hour blackout. There was a, a, a problem that we had with a bit of, it was about 2 a.m. Things went wrong. But I think our producer, Trent, has cut out the blackout. We might then put out the blackout, especially for fans of technical blackouts. If you'd like that, uh, then I know that's a very kind of Andy Warhol thing. So so he might have cut out the blackout. So if you've turned onto this in particular to watch half an hour of nothing happening, that might not happen. So John Cage fans, we will find another way of pleasing you later on. Uh, but in this section, uh, what we did definitely have, we had Dr. Carl, who managed to answer pretty much every question that you threw at him. And uh, then after that, we stayed in Australia for Colin Lane and Sean McAuliffe, where we talked about uh, love of stand up, uh, love of slapstick, Jack Tatty, Buster Keaton and many other things. I hope you enjoy it. Um, the, uh, but there is a, Carlos Frank, who I've mentioned before, and I would really, uh, there's a lovely desert island disc with, with Carlos Frank, actually, who, uh, he's based up at Durham University, and, and during lockdown, uh, most Wednesdays, I would kind of meet up with him. We would we'd have these little, you know, oh. Zoom chats, right. and he would explain the universe to me. We'd talk about a lot of other things as well. He would insist I must see Ingmar Bergman's version of the magic flute. He was <laughs> correct. Um... But he has this this great... One of the things that I find fascinating, he loves using art when trying to explain ideas like dark matter and dark energy. And, and one of the images he uses is... Uh, anyone at home, you can look this up now because you're at your computer. As far as I remember, one of the titles of it has different titles. is The Lovers by Magritte. I don't know if you know, it's a Magritte I do painting. Know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, two people kissing, but they've got their, their faces covered. Yeah. And he said Fantastic. that to him is part of that, that thing, is they can't actually see that there is a, a knowledge there, there is a sensation of love there, but this thing remains invisible to them. And that's kind of the mission of and our that's journey. that's dark, dark matter... Dark energy, sort of yeah. Brother. Um, Both of those, uh, you know, in, in particular, uh, I, I, I think on that occasion, dark matter, because of course, dark matter and dark energy. The problem is, some idiot gave them very similar names yeah, to explain yeah. very different Both things. Completely different things, yeah. But um, that is, uh, and you do. I mean, you've been doing those great shows with uh, with Chris Lintot, who will be joining again later. Yeah, and, and that. that bit but that's been that's been a real a real treat doing those with Chris. In fact, one of my last gigs before lockdown was I think you did the same festival um, up in uh, up in Dark Skies, Dark yeah. Skies Festival, Dark. which was absolutely phenomenal. Um, we, yeah, and it's we we Chris Lintot and I do a, a sort of double double hander show where essentially he asks me about music and I ask him about. Uh, astronomy um, and so uh, and and but and also we look at a bit of the crossover and I think I think because there is quite a lot of crossover one of the things we do in that show uh, and I've done actually on my podcast as well is there's an um, uh, exoplanet system which uh, the the planets are in harmonic um, orbit so in other words every time planet A goes round once planet B goes round twice and three and so on and so and it, and someone um, uh, uh, an astronomer called Matt Russo um, in the states has sort of sonified these so put a note on for each one of these um, and it, it, and uh, so he's created this beautiful kind of musical thing and 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 I do a kind of improvisation with this planetary system 600 light years away and because because yeah again that the, the the use of art to I mean essentially your you, art and physics both do the same thing, which is to try and I explain the inexplicable, or at least reflect, you know, our experience of the inexplicable. And I think music, in particular, what is, what's so exciting about it for me is, and particularly why I like uh, instrumental music, is that it, it is abstract. So it allows you to express things that you can't always express with words, because you have this much more kind of um, lizard brain connection to it. You don't you don't quite understand. You know, I think it's an interesting thing that because what I would say is that both art, good art and good science are trying to create some sense of, 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 of connection and understanding. But the mm. difference is that art can always remain subjective. Yes. So, I, But I, I do think that's the interesting connection. I was having, a, actually I'll better introduce our next guest, but later on I'll tell you what I was talking <laughs> about with Brian Eno. Anyway, uh, now our, our next guest is someone who, I think he's done the last two actually, he's popped over to do, he, he, he flies over, he does about 17 
lectures and gigs in about three days, and and then he goes back to Australia. Uh, but so Australia now, does that mean have we hit four continents now? We're still three behind. We've, we've uh, now yeah, done that's four, isn't it? We did Australasia. We've done South America. We've done North, North America, America. Uh, and, and we've obviously done Europe. Europe. Yeah, so yeah. I think we're on four. Oh, and we've done Singapore, of course, because we've oh, yeah, so yeah. that's Asia as well. Yeah. Okay, okay we've only five. got two continents left, so <laughs> keep watching for that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome. He's going to answer your questions, because I'm certainly not, not in this state of mind. Dr. Carl. Hello, Dr. Carl. How are you doing? Ahoy, good morning. How do you think? Very uh, well. How's my sound? One, two, three, four, five. Is oh, it sounds you? great. Your sound. Every word we're getting, if it's cutting out, it doesn't matter what it's cutting out. It's coming out in a way that I can totally see is comprehensible. Um, we have got uh, so many questions for you. So I'm just going to get straight in there with the, with the questions. Let's start off with... Uh, now, this is... Uh, I, I think this is... Uh, I think this must mean, why can't we tickle ourselves? But I might be wrong. Uh, let's just see. Oh, no, here we go. Why can we make ourselves itch? As in, if someone says, my foot is itchy, often your own foot then gets itchy. How does that work? So that kind of psychosomatic link of... It's like watching a film where the, it's very snowy or you see something where suddenly spiders crawl over someone and, and it seems to infect our own bodies. You're, you've answered the question already, Dr. Robin. It is psychosomatic, where you can convince yourself into anything, because the purpose of the brain, it appears, if there is any purpose to evolution, is not so much as to try to make sense of the world, but try to get rid of the overwhelming amount of information. So, with regard to itch, the thing to realise is that we don't know that, that much about itch. We know that there are itch nerves. We've been only learning about them for the last 15 years. We, secondly, some types of itch are caused by histamines, and they can be stopped by antihistamines, but some are not. And one terrible case was of a young woman who had an itch on her scalp and kept on scratching through her hair to make a bald spot, through her flesh, and literally with her fingernails over a period of months through her skull until she got to her brain, and then she stopped. So um, itch is something that we don't fully understand. And then finally, itch and pain are on a kind of a seesaw. When one goes up, the other one goes down. And so the classic case is that if you have a large dose of opiates, the pain goes away, but suddenly you're itchy. Psychosomatic? Oh, yes. The brain can induce anything, whether it's seeing angels or regarding yourself as the most handsome or attractive human on earth. Is the is the one in partic in particular sensation? Maybe it is itching. I'm not sure. Which is the most in in terms of contaminating other people in a psychosomatic way? Is there one thing? You know, if you, if you see people in a room and they see one person doing something or one person reacting, the one that manages con to contaminate the largest number of people. Um, yawns are pretty good at that. So we don't fully understand yawns either. And I'm going to give you a new word, which is pandiculation. Pandiculation, do learn this for your nearest crossword clue. So here I am yawning, ah, I just yawned. Here I am pandiculating. So to pandiculate is to yawn and stretch your arms at the same time. And in the 1920s, we learned from the clever observations of a medical doctor in England, that some people who were paralyzed and who could not move their right arm voluntarily couldn't move their right arm involuntarily when they pandiculated in a yawn and so with you now getting so that was a little detour now getting back to answering your question yawning is contagious if number one you are kind and compassionate uh, and number two you can express it so you might be kind and compassionate but you might be a bit shy in that case you're not so likely to catch a yawn why it is useful to catch a yawn well if Evolutionary biologists come up with all sorts of theories, but maybe it's sort of like you and me, Robin, are doing the night shift of the tribe, and you yawn and I yawn, and that proves that we're together against the killer dinosaurs or whatever it is, or Bigfoot or Big Feets that are out there. Now, let's find out the next question. They've come, gone off the screen, so if someone can put the questions back on the screen, that would be fantastic. Uh, the next question we have is from Angus. Angus would like to know, why is red wine so hard to get out of fabric? Why does it stain and so quickly? And I bet you have also got the best answer for how to get red wine out, because you always have the best answer for how to get rid of jet lag. I'm reckoning this is going to be another of your practical uh, answers. 
Don't know. Uh, this is chemistry, and anything to do with the physics of the outer electrons, I'm pretty weak on. I've heard of salt being used, and there's an osmotic action being involved. I think we need a real chemist. I'm bowing out. I'm not going to contaminate your brain with my lack of knowledge. Don't Next. worry. We've got a, a chemist who's going to be on about 7 a.m., so we'll be able to cover that. That'll be fine. Uh, uh, the next one is about how to get mayonnaise out of a sofa, so I hope we can deal with that. It's not. Uh, the next one is from Mick. Mick would like to know, how can a planet have a stable orbit when it's between two binary stars? Um, there are different degrees of stability. So the first thing to realise is that if you had in the entire universe just one object, a star, and one planet orbiting it, it would be possible to have a stable circular orbit. The moment you bring in other, ob or, uh, other objects in that solar system, you're going to have elliptical orbits. And so in the case of Mercury, Mercury, its orbital dynamics was, were influenced by the other planets outside, all the way out to Jupiter, etc. How can you have a stable orbit between two planets? There will be, a, uh, you'll end up with some sort of mathematical resonance where you've got a, a 3, 2 or 5, 4 or some integer number colon integer number resonance. And we have a few of those in our solar system. The most famous one is the Neptune-Pluto one where in the time taken for Neptune to do three orbits, Pluto does two. And they are locked together and they interact with each other gravitationally to make that stable because it's so close to an integer number in their relationship with each other, they just need a little bit of a tweak to keep it there. Uh, that, that is my weak non-astrophysics uh, answer to that question. I, 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 an astrophysicist would give a better answer. Uh, and let's again, it's fine. We've got another one turning up. I think he's here about 5 a.m. We can keep going with this. This is uh, Amber would like to know what is the point of crying? As in, why, when we sad, does water come out of our eyes? It's a bit of a mystery. Firstly, there are three types of water there's some water that is generated by the little cells little glands on the white of your eye, the sclera, and that makes a liquid that is optimised for sticking to your cornea or sclera, the eyeball. Then, in the upper outer quadrant of each eye socket, there is another gland called the lacrimal gland, and it pumps out just bulk liquid. It's salt water, and it goes across the eye, it comes to the inner corner here, and then drains down the back of your nose. And then finally, there is a third liquid coming from glands on the inside of the eyelid, I think they're called myobium glands, and that has a fatty layer to it, so therefore it reduces the evaporation. So it's the liquid on your eyes. It was thought that the liquid varied, as uh, depending on the sort of crying you were doing, then that theory went away with better data. We're still up in the air on that one. I don't know the latest. Finally, why do we cry? We cry because of an irritating chemical. So for example, onions, unfortunately, do not have legs, so they defend themselves with biochemical warfare and they put a chemical with lots of sulfur that goes into the air and irritates our cornea. So chemical irritation can make us cry to wash it away, but also you have um, dust, physical irritation, and then finally, the last one, emotional crying. We do not know why we do that. Now, the evolutionary biologists, again, have come up with a bunch of reasons. It is said in the popular press that having a good cry makes you feel better, but only if you are in the presence of friendly people around you who will comfort you and protect you and listen to you and then help you work through the difficult issues. But if you're by yourself in a crowd, at the very least, you'll just look like an idiot crying away weeping. And on the other hand, somebody will say, he or she is crying, let me steal their smartphone or their handbag or their shoes. So it seems to be a total disadvantage to cry, the emotional crying. We do not understand why we have the emotional crying. Well, let's remain ocular for a while because Greg would like to know, why do we close our eyes when we sneeze? It's part of the reflex. You can, in fact, try really hard and if you try over a period of an hour you can make yourself 
not sneeze. If you, sorry, not, not close your eyelids. If you keep your eyelids open, you still do not pop your eyes out. It, it is not there to keep your eyes in. So when you sneeze, you build up pressure in your thoracic cavity, your chest cavity, and then you suddenly release it. And when I was studying third year medicine, just for fun, I memorized the entire neurological pathway of all the things that happen when you sneeze. And it's truly complex. Um, and it's a very important pathway to have because Unlike your mouth, if things go into your mouth and into your gut, they come out the other end. If they go into your lungs, they don't come out. So you've got to have this sneeze reflex fairly powerfully developed. And if anything, have it too powerful, so that way at least you're getting stuff out and you embarrass yourself by sneezing. So the closing of the eyes is just part of that reflex, and we don't know how it got in there. In this case, my poor inadequate answer is evolution doesn't have to be perfect, comma, just good enough for you to have babies. And if you're stuck with some ancient reflex that you close your eyes when you sneeze, hey, if you can have babies, evolution doesn't care. Now, the, uh, the next one is uh, from uh, Rachel B, who would like to know the worst scientific Christmas cracker joke, please. And we can come back to that if you want. I'm just going to put that in your brain if you're not ready immediately for that. Ooh, I'm not ready for it. Now, I'm glad you're back here again, Dr. Robin, but actually... You're not back. You're not all back. Only half of you is back. The other half is front. <laughs> Fair enough. There we go. The Kraken factory is closing years, down. The, uh, uh, what's your favourite invention? This is Kate would like to know this. What's your favourite invention of the 21st century? Of the 21st century? Okay. My favourite invention of all time is the S-bend on the toilet. Because in a toilet, you've got your bathroom here, and down there, you've got the sewerage system. And how much of the smell comes through? Zero. Because you have got a valve, which is this loop of water, not rubber, not wood, not steel, which needs maintenance, but, but water. And you're using water as a combined seal and flush. Not only does it flush the nasties, although they're not nasties, away in the sewage system, each time you flush the toilet, you get a new lot of water acting as a valve. It's just so perfect. I just love the S-Bend. Of the 21st century, um, with reservations, the smartphone. So the first smartphone, forget the iPhone 1 and the iPhone 2, but the iPhone 3, I took it with me across Spain in 2009 when we walked across Spain 790 kilometres in five weeks. And it was amazing. There was this little box I had in my hand and it was a camera and it was a, also a, a, a device for getting internet and email access and maps and I could take notes on it. And it even had back then in 2009 a Spanish English language translator, which wasn't particularly good. So I gave up on it after when I said, my father-in-law is a little allergic to nuts. And that translated as my crazy father-in-law has small testicles. So I gave up on that. And that's the good side of the smartphone. The bad side comes out if you watch that movie um, on Netflix, The Social Dilemma, or if you read The System by somebody called Ball, or you read uh, Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana, somebody else. And basically, we've, got, we've had this massive death of investigative journalism because of the rise of advertising. And we've also had a tripling of the self-harm and suicide rate among young females and it's a whole complex social thing so this thing the smartphone comes with advantages and disadvantages and i'm saying it should be regulated and people say no don't regulate the internet mate i'm not allowed to punch you on the nose if i get into a car i have to put on a seat belt if i'm in a restaurant i have to provide certain health set standards i don't mind regulation and if it means that we reduce the suicide rate in young female female teenagers and we get back investigative journalism i'm in there for a bit of regulation yeah i think that's an interesting thing isn't it it seems that now somehow this strange free speech where apparently we've always been allowed to say whatever we we want and and the amount of damage you know that it, it's become a very damaging 
Uh, and, and I think for liberals, you immediately feel, oh, hang on, no, but people should be allowed to say what they say, but hang on, what are the repercussions? I think that's a, 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 you know, a rich area for us to truly investigate, and I, I agree with you there a great deal. Uh, this is, uh, uh, this Ian, uh, Ian's five-year-old has this question. Why is water wet? A difficult question, but I have a bit of an answer. The wetness of water depends upon, firstly, the surface tension of water, and secondly, the surface upon which it sits. Now, let me deal with the surfaces. So suppose it's been raining and you're walking down a street and there's a bunch of cars. On all of the new cars, with the paint being new, the water will not wet them. But rather, you've got a series of individual droplets, boop, 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 and they refuse to go and you know, spread out. Only if you get too much water does it spread out. But if you go to a car with old paint that's worn out, even just one drop will spread over a large area, and that reduces the surface tension. So the first aspect of wetness is the surface. And so, for example, the lotus root, which is a delicious vegetable, associated with that is a leaf, and it does not wet is very fatty and it's got little hairs, and so the water does not wet the surface. So water is wet depending on the surface. And then secondly, we're talking about surface tension. Surface tension is the tendency for water, if we're using that as an example, when it comes out of a tap, when you're dripping it very slowly, to come out in little balls, all neatly rolled up, instead of just a continuous stream. And that's because there's a net inward flow. Force, and that's because of the molecule H2O. Water is made of little boomerangs. I know this is hard to believe, five-year-old person, but it is. And the boomerangs are called H2O, which means hydrogen on the outside here, hydrogen there, and an oxygen in the middle. And the oxygens are negative, and the hydrogens are positive. And they tend to stick to each other if they're not shaking around too much. Think about a water molecule in the bulk of the liquid. It's attracted forwards, but backwards equally, left, right equally, up, down equally. Now we come to the end. Think about a molecule of water, a little boomerang, on the very surface of the water. It's attracted back forward, left, right, and it's attracted inwards, because there's some water molecules under it, but not upwards, because there's only air above it. And so it is pulled inwards. Think about surface tension. Look up on Wikipedia. You have a really good time. Brilliant. And uh, uh, oh, Phoebe would just like to know, are you going to go and watch the Geminids tonight? Um, at the moment, I'm in a part of the world where we had eight inches or 200 millimetres of rain last night. Um, I'm heading down the coast from, I'm in a part of the world called, wait for it, the Promised Land up in the north coast of New South Wales. I'm heading back to Sydney, and I intend to look at the Geminids. And they're interesting because they are meteors that come not from an asteroid, but from... Oh, sorry, not, not, not from a comet, but from an asteroid. And by the way, if you want to get the words out so you're properly obsessive and pedantic, it's a meteoroid when it's in space. It's a meteor in the atmosphere, from the Greek word meteor meaning atmosphere, and hence the science of meteorology. And finally, the little thing that you pick up on the ground when you find one is a meteorite. And yes, I'm going to watch it. This is the universe's free TV set. I'm in there for that free entertainment. Right on, yes. <laughs> uh, and uh, this one is, why doesn't it hurt when we cut our toenails, but if we break one off, it hurts like hell? Um... If you cut it neatly, okay, so firstly, toenails and hair are made of exactly the same protein by atomic mass and, atomic, and atoms. That's a protein called keratin, but it's arranged differently. One is in sheets and the other one is not. And so one type of keratin on the hair is soft and floppy and the other type of keratin is hard. If you are lucky enough to tear the fingernail from one part of the fingernail to the other part of the fingernail without going into the bed on the side. There is no pain. But if you intersect any of the stuff underneath or on the side, then you're tearing it away before it's been naturally pushed off, and that's why it hurts. 
Now, I'm going to ask you the final question I'm going to ask you. I reckon it's an answer which will take at least two minutes. I desperately need the loo because I haven't had a loo break for quite a while, and it's 2 a.m. here. Uh, if I'm not back in time, thank you very much. And Steve will go straight into playing some jazz. And then I'm going to introduce uh, another couple of fantastic from also from Australia. We have uh, Sean McAuliffe and Colin Lane are going to be joining us. But uh, Dr. Carl, the final question I want to ask you is, uh, we've had this from a few people, what can we do to persuade those who are being anti-scientific or indeed anti-vaccination? What are the most persuasive ways of wooing people towards evidence-based thinking? You have at least two minutes, starting from now. Ah. That's a very difficult one. I've been following on with this with regard to climate change. Change. I wrote my very first story on climate change in 1981. In 1990, um, the scientists all agreed that climate change was real, and at the same time, the fossil fuel companies reversed their stance of supporting science in climate change and turned into denying it. And now, as, an, as one example, two years after the scientists said, after decades of research, two years after the scientists said, hey, CFCs are punching a hole in the ozone layer, 1987, we banned CFCs, 1989. Took us two years. But 30 years after we, we decided, the scientists said that climate change is real and that we're causing it and it's going to be expensive, we got nothing because the fossil fuel companies are still mounting their massive denialist campaign. So on one hand, we'll get to the vaccines in a minute, but on one hand with regard to fighting the climate change thing, by the year 2013, according to the newspaper The Guardian, the fossil fuel companies are already spending one billion, B for billion, not, M, not B for Bravo, billion dollars a year on mounting a massive disinformation comp campaign. Hello, back again. So getting back to the other concept of what do you do about vaccination, the thing to realise, it's about the tribe. People are more affected by their tribe than they are by hard science. And so if you belong to the East Manchester Sewing Circle, you might well say, well, because I belong to the East Manchester Sewing Circle, I am prepared to accept the six times tables and the eight times tables, but not the seven times tables. Uh, 7 by 2 is not 14, that is a lie. So I think the way in is by following Dr. Karen Hayhoe, who was a climate scientist and um, a born-again Christian and married to a minister in Texas. And she says that the most important thing is to listen to them to become part of their tribe and just go with it. And you, you I'm sure you've had the same thing yourself, Robin, where with great perspective, Cassidy and Wisdom, Wisdom, you've read up Choice Magazine or which magazine to work out what is the best sort of phone or uh, car or kettle to buy, right? and you've looked up all the figures, and then suddenly two of your friends say, oh, I like that one, and bingo, all that research is out the window, and you go with the tribe. So the thing is to bring them into the tribe. Now, I do not know what the answer is. It broke my heart just to finish off that a survey in the United Kingdom in late November said it, or ask the question, if there is a vaccine that is perfectly safe and effective, would you take it? It broke my heart that 56% of people said no. So they've been tribalised, and this then goes back to the social media who, and, and I'll just finish on this, every time you click on a web link, your, your details between 3 and 14 gigabytes uh, offer up to about 500 advertisers who will pay between one and five cents for the right to show you stuff on the next homepage you come to. And the truth of what you're shown does not matter, only the fact that you click. By the way, little aside here, if you're a financial sort of person, they'll pay up 20 cents to advertise to you. But for people like you and me, Robert, it's a lousy one to five cents. So they don't care, and it's in their interests to put forward outrageous stuff that's not true if it makes you click. I think that a large part 
comes from the social media, which needs to be brought in. And there's two main organisations. There's Facebook and Google who make the massive amounts of advertising. Over to you, Dr. Robin, and thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Carl. It's really it's great to have you. I'm sorry you're not actually here this year. It's always great to have you when you're actually in King's Place as well. And I think there was an interesting thing. There was an article in National Geographic about five years ago, which kind of, again, when you're talking about the tribal thing, where uh, and it was about the rise of of, of anti science and one of the stories was uh, a young scientist and she was you know involved in in climate change science and her dad was totally into all the conspiracy theories that it was made up and she kept trying she would show him all of these graphs she would show him photographs and he wouldn't believe it and she then found the way to persuade him was when she went dad isn't this weird you believe all of these men who you've never even met who I'm basically explaining uh, making this stuff up, or it's just it, it's it's misreading the uh, the statistics, but you don't believe your own daughter, and it was that that started to it suddenly went you know so it was the emotional, uh, and I think that's one of the things as you see you know finding that way of getting people in, and it's not always with the facts initially. So thank you so much. It's uh, it's always good. We're going to stay in Australia. We're going to say goodbye to Dr. Carl, but we're going to stay in Australia. And we're going to, I'm going to start before I introduce uh, our next two guests because uh, I, as as people who maybe watched some of the um, early podcasts we did during lockdown, we talked quite a lot uh, about uh, one particular person who uh, is uh, uh, one of the stars here of The Goodies File. Uh, this is my copy of The Goodies File, which I'm proud to say is signed by all three goodies. And uh, one of the last live events that I did, uh, not actually probably a couple of months before, but back at the end of January, uh, I did two events with Tim Brooke Taylor. Uh, I did a great fun event with Graham Garden and Bill Oddie as well for the 50th anniversary of The Goodies. And then had just this delightful conversation with him about the show at last, the 1948 show. Very, very important sketch show. And actually, a lot of it's still very funny. And Tim's work on it, magnificent. And Tim was so filled with Joie de Vivre and so funny and so quick-witted. And he is one of the people who, uh, you know, I, I know many people have lost people. And, and Tim, for me, in terms of the showbiz people, he, he felt for a, a, quite a few generations of people, I think the loss of Tim was, uh, uh, you know, a, a terribly sad thing. And so I'm going to read Tim Brooke Taylor, age nine, one of his love poems. This is The Kiss by Tim Brooke Taylor. Linda Cosgrave kissed me. It nearly made me sick. I wasn't even looking. Oh, what a beastly trick. Her mouth was wet and greasy, and her sticky little lips were full of salt and vinegar. She'd been eating fish and chips. I told her she was yucky, and she went off in a huff. If that's what girls are going to be like, I'm going to be her anyway. So that is one of Tim's uh, poems. Uh, I also have one of my favourite things, again, as well, mentioning we're, we're going up to Stornoway, where there's the wonderful stones of Kalanish, and the yeah. goodies were always brilliant at kind of satirizing pseudoscience and all of those mysteries that used to exist in, in the kind of Eric Von Daniken things. Um, and one of them, one of my favorites is uh, Britain, land of secret legends, the standing men of Hoy. In the remote Orkney Islands, you can find a circle of large upright stones. It is said that if you stand alone in the middle of the circle, stark naked at sunset on Midsummer's Eve, with one leg in the air, you will eventually see some men standing watching you. Sooner or later, one of the standing men will probably shout, Hoy! Oi, what's your game? <laughs> and then there's a, the, the hiding ghost of Straddling Hall. Sir Harry Straddling was a shy man who hid from people throughout his life. Upon his deathbed, he promised that he would come back and hide from people. <laughs> you may scoff, but his ghost has never been seen. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so sad about, about Tim. I mean, as you say, so many people um, this year, but... Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't know him, know him like you know, like you do, but I've, I've always been a great admirer of his work on radio. And oh, he's magnificent. Well. I mean, do you know what? Two of the people, and uh, obviously, actually, the last one was was the end of last year. Neil Linnis was the other one. Neil Linnis yeah. and Tim Brooke Taylor. Uh, there's a great series on on. Uh, um, the, uh, not more four, I forget what it's called now, four extra, uh, which is all about uh, Neil and is made by Laura Grimshaw, which I really recommend you listen to because like what Tim and Neil, I think both of them, I, I spent time with at the Slapstick Fest from other places is the love of what they did and the joy of sharing that joy with other people. Um, and we're now going to be joined by two people who do exactly that as well. Uh, um, we're not going to be joined by them. It's been changed, so I'm now going to read another poem. Okay. 
But there is, I mean, I, I'm going to mention actually three other, because, you know, the, the, this year, I suppose you, you, you start to reach an age where you go, oh, not just your childhood, but people you work with. And, and some of these names might not mean that much to people watching, but they were very important in when I started on the circuit and people that I work with. Uh, there was a wonderful uh, comedian based up in Manchester called Stan Vernon, who died a couple of months ago and used to run wonderful, quirky, weird clubs. Uh, my friend Gina Ryan, who was one of the most... She, she did, uh, when she, I remember doing a gig with her in Milton Keynes where it was the normal tiresome thing of the, one of the men in the audience that, oh, it's a woman on stage. And he just kept shouting out, show us your tits, like that. Gotcha. And Gina's put down, all she did was she just went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, and then she would continue and eat, oh, no, show us your tits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. And this way that she brushed him off, you could see this man shrinking. She just kept, she just kept using the... Every time he shouted, she didn't engage with him. She just kind of, yeah, 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 like that. And it was perfect. Fantastic. Um, and the one other one I'll mention is George Jeffrey, who perhaps became best known as a, as a writer. He did the Windsor's series. The, oh, yeah, yeah. That, and uh, wrote with uh, Bert Tyler Moore. And, uh, and he died suddenly this year. And George was in a double act uh, called Chris and George. And uh, they were so fantastic. One of my favourite jokes of all time uh, was Chris and George. At one point they would go, uh, actually, uh, George and I are going to go up the Everest uh, the hard way. That's right, Chris. We are going to go up Everest the hard way. We're going to go up Everest without oxygen. And uh, we don't just mean without oxygen tanks. We mean with <laughs> plastic bags tied very tightly over our heads. They were an absolute delight. Um, I will, uh, um, Steve, because we've got, a, we've got a little bit of a, and thank you very much, by the way, everyone who's still watching and sending supportive messages and all of those things. Uh, we're into, are we in the 15th hour now? What are we, we at? Uh, 2.15. Uh, yeah, so uh, the 15th yeah, hour. Yeah, yeah, 15th and, hour. And yeah. I hope you're enjoying it. And I, I hope this is, uh, you know, as I said, one of the reasons we're doing this is, is because we weren't able to do the normal live shows. And uh, so also thank you for, I'm not sure what we're up to. Last time I looked about two and a half hours ago, we'd made uh, 16,000. Uh, pounds um, and uh, so yeah made, made 16,000 pounds and uh, that's absolutely fantastic I'm not by the way entirely sure uh, where we are and what's going on at the moment just so you know that's fine, that's uh, fine there is a possibility that we're not even broadcasting anymore sure just gotcha. so I don't know if you are if so anything can see us I, we of course won't know that because there's no uh, yeah there's, the, there's, there's no trace so we might be talking to no one <laughs> we might have always been talking to <laughs> no, no one this might have always we been have no what idea. our career a... uh, was um, so I don't know who's able to check whether we've entirely whether someone backstage as well is able to look on their phone and see if uh, we're getting something uh, on, on this particular one I can still see the uh Phoebe, hello by the way, Phoebe. This is can you just to find out because we're not entirely sure because there's been a Wi-Fi problem. Uh, can you still so so if I say uh, the secret message, which is Trandom, that is the secret message, Trandom. If you are still able to uh, hear us watching on YouTube, please now type Trandom, and we will find out what's going on. <laughs> it's not looking good. It's there's no great, Trandom yet. We will discover shortly. <laughs> No, Nick Hurley is going good. He's going good. Yeah, there's a few people going uh, to sleep. Um, yeah, so there we Quitters. are. Quitters. Quitters. Yeah, so, uh, but they, they might be awake again. But who knows what's, what's been going on? <laughs> Uh, let's just see. Oh, let's see. The tech, tech team, can they, Pale Blue Dock? Uh, yeah, I think we can. Uh, hey, guys. I think you're back. Hello, everyone. I hope you can see us now. I'm looking in the chat room. We haven't had a sleep, by the way. We should make this clear. We've not no. used this for snoozing. No. We've actually been talking about showbiz and music. Have. We have. We've just been um, carrying on as normal, essentially. So, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a few of the things that are going on. Thank you very much, everyone. And we've been looking at the chat room. It's real. I am now wearing the, uh, the worst, well, not the worst T-shirt, not for the subject, but it's a colour I don't normally wear. But I thought at this point, because all of you, uh, you know, it's kind of bedtime. I was going to wear, I've got my pyjama bottoms. I might put those on later really? on. But I am wearing my Daphne and Celeste T-shirt, which I right. feel is very much the kind of sleepy time T-shirt <laughs> when it gets chilly in the winter. I went to see Daphne and Celeste, who were fantastic at the Tough Tough 
National Park Dome uh, with a friend of mine, and uh, and we kind of my friend Michael, and we were kind of uh, like, oh God, should we actually? You know, we're probably going to be really freaky. You know, these weird old men going in there. But it turned out we were the least freaky people. But there's, a, the, the, but I mean, you know, I don't mean this with any offence to you, but there's a lot of weird old men who like Daphne and Celeste. And I, anyway, but I, that's not. I'd not realised that. Right, because right. I mean, it came from the fact that I used to do a show with my mate Michael, and we would actually yeah. open yeah, with yeah. Uh, "Ooh, stick you, your mama too, and your daddy," and we would do this <laughs> really scary. You know, again, if David Lynch had decided to do the Daphne and Celeste story, he goes, <laughs> "Yeah, I think those two guys would be great." Uh, it was very much that kind of uh, thing, and uh, so I, I'll tell you what we're, we're hopefully doing. There's, there's obviously been a few changes. I'm just. Yeah, I can hear exactly what you're saying. Trent is just uh, giving me some instructions. Right, so short... Sean and Colin are going to be back in a minute. I'm going to read something because I, I brought loads of, of books and I'm not going to, because we're just back and we'll do something upbeat. I've got a slightly sadder bit, which uh, I might read um, later on, but we'll, we'll save that for when Steve and I are both in the, in the really kind of emotional doldrums of, of, of being. I don't know, any of you who are insomniacs and, and obviously anyone who's watching us perhaps in the UK is, uh, is, is possibly uh, an insomniac. Um, I've always found that about between 3.50 a.m. and 5 a.m. is the scary bit. That is... Ah, brilliant. We are joined by Sean McAuliffe and, uh, and Colin Lane. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we have... Everything was going technically very well. It was saving itself for one grand moment of collapse. Uh, the machines became sentient, and yet they were also anti-scientific, so they shut us down for a while. But now we're back. Um... Hello. Hello. How are you? Now, Robin, I've, uh, I've, I just ate a lozenger because I was waiting so long. I thought I could chance my arm and actually eat a lozenge. And uh, so if I sound rude uh, and, and, and slobbery, that's the reason. It's no, you fault. don't. It's added to your eloquence. It's very beautiful lozenges. It must be a merchant ivory lozenge, one of those ones that uh, creates that kind of, uh, of, of... I was going to say, one of the things I'd like to talk about, and uh, Sean, uh, the last time we spoke, we talked about this, but because it's the end of the year and because I know how important they were uh, in Australia, and we were going to talk about slapstick. And the slapstick festival in the UK... Um, one of the uh, the last events I did in the Slapstick event in January uh, was an event with Tim Brooke Taylor, and uh, Tim Brooke Taylor, of course, just such a uh, you know, wonderful radio comedian, TV comedian, at last the 1948 show, and the goodies being this wonderful, you know, it's so huge in Australia. Um, so I wanted to talk about your first of all from both of you. The, your first introductions to slapstick. What were the TV shows that you saw uh, that you revered when you were kids? That you actually thought, "This is why I wanted." You know, that that moment where you realised the seeds of wanting to be a comedian. Can I start with you, Sean? Well, um, Colin and I probably had a similar experience. Colin's a little bit younger than me, but we um, we probably were exposed to the goodies, which was usually what we watched when we came home after school. So we kind of got this, and because they would often do a lot of big physical stuff, which quoted the silent film era. Uh, uh, a lot of Buster Keaton jokes ended up in the goodies. Uh, it was They were the equivalent of the, what The Simpsons are to a lot of people now, I suspect. You know, you get to see these secondary references and then you discover the original source later on. And there was a, there was a, a TV series called Fractured Flickers, which I think they just uh, basically cut up a whole lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, silent film comedies and just ran them for half an hour. So I kind of got that. Uh, that was my first exposure as a, as a like a ten year old watching that sort of stuff. Probably on Saturday mornings was a bunch of just the best of or a sampler of silent film comedy. And uh, Colin might be a bit too young to remember that, so he might have a different experience. So, Colin, what was, uh, yeah, what was your first kind of introduction to the idea of, I want to create something like that? Well, I mean, I, I do know that Get Smart wasn't shown a lot in uh, the UK, apparently, and uh, a, a few other um, uh, American sitcoms of the late 60s and 70s. But Get Smart and The Goodies were seminal uh, to me uh, when I was a 10, 11, 12-year-old. Uh, but, I mean, 
on television during the week, uh, which I love to watch at length, I mean, you had Get Smart, I Dream of Jeannie, Bewitched, uh, The Goodies, and then maybe The Kenny Everett Show. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on Friday night, you had uh, all of those shows, plus you had The Two Ronnies, Pot, Pot Black, um, <laughs> and, 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 and then Dave Allen. So we spent many a time, and I think it's got a lot. And then on Saturday afternoons, you'd watch a lot of Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin and Adam Costello and maybe a few Marx Brothers films. Uh, but I guess in some way, and, and even Monty Python on tape in those days. Um, but a lot of those things are influenced by your friends, but a lot of those things are influenced what, uh, by what you would watch as a family. And my father used to love the two Ronnies. And, um, I mean, there's a bit of a folklore about how fathers would go to the hardware store on a Saturday morning and then they'd come home and sit in the garage for about an hour and mum would say, where's dad? Is he still at the hardware? No, he's in the garage listening to the goons because the goons was on the radio, I think, midday on a Saturday over in Australia. So, But the goodies was a huge impact um, on the comedy that Lane and Woodley have done. And, and I, yeah, I was deeply saddened by uh, the passing of Tim Brooke Taylor this year. And we were very fortunate as well to actually have Bob Spears, who directed some of the goodies, to direct episodes of our TV show as well. He's, he said if he saw another metre of fishing line, he'd kill himself. <laughs> that is, I mean, Bob Spears, what a career, because he got Faulty Towers there. He then did the comic strip Present as well. He did some of that. So, I mean, that is covering, Dad's even though that, that's Absolutely a 10-year fabulous. period. Sorry. Absolutely Fabulous, Dad's Army. Um, Spice many others. World? I, pardon me? He did Spice World. I think he did the Spice Girls movie as well. That was yes, him. he directed two episodes of The Adventures of Landon Woodley and then went over to the US and directed um, a Spice Girls film. And then before he came and saw us, he was making a Disney film called That Darn Cat. <laughs> um. oh, that was a remake, wasn't it? That was the second version of That Darn Cat. I think the first one had um, Dean... Oh, you'll know this, Sean. What was his Dean name? Dean Jones. Dean yeah. Jones. I think yes. I'm sure the people online will correct any any errors. I, I want to also ask just that one of my things that I love watching is you know when you watch uh, a certain bit of slapstick and you try and work out how it's done because to me it is like conjuring. It is you know whether it is that there's a, a, a pratfall that Bill Murray does in Scrooge, which is just a trip over a series of steps, but I could never quite work out how he'd done it. In the same way, Buster Keaton, I think maybe in Cops, where he grabs onto the side of a tram and flies up in the air, a yeah. moving tram. Now, that one, it turns out, is a very simple answer, was that Buster Keaton grabbed hold of a moving tram, uh, <laughs> which is very often the kind of Buster... How did Buster Keaton do that? Oh, he broke his arm. Uh, you know, that is, uh, um, but the, do you have favourite moments of, of those where you just think, I'm going to find out, I'm going to work out, and, and you must have had those moments, Colin, where you've thought, we want to create a moment of, of, of physical comedy which people will find you know, bewildering and like a magic trick. Uh, well, I wish Frank would hit, was here because he's a huge uh, buff of Buster Keaton and he would be able to, um, in a very entertaining and enlightening manner, uh, tell you about his favourite uh, bits of uh, Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin. But I think um, because I'm not uh, as au fait with that, uh, the mechanics of it, but I do remember filming a scene for Lane and Woodley where I had to ski down an Olympic swimming pool dressed as an inflatable penguin and if if you watch the show it, it's a it's it's one of my favorite parts of the show but we were trying to figure out how we would drag me down an olympic sized swimming pool and then in the production meeting frank went well why don't we get a pulley at the end of the pool that connects to a pulley on the street and then we'll get one of the um stunt guys trucks to pull that pulley so it propels me down the pool and everybody in the production meeting just thought that he was an idiot and just a complete fool and just scoffed and were agog and aghast and that's exactly how we did it and and some sometimes those um little ideas that you have uh are the simplest are the best ideas but i do remember you know buster keaton used to film a lot of things in reverse didn't he to, to, to get the 
to get the physicalizations? I think certainly there's a scene in the in the uh, uh, the train movie in the the, the general where the yeah. <laughs> Where the train, you can actually see the smoke going back into the stack as it's as it's driving along up to him and stops just short of him. So, you know that that's a bit of a giveaway when the smoke actually goes in the opposite direction to what it would do in nature. You, you know, you, you kind of. Can I ask you a question though, Cole, about the last episode of I think the second series of Lane on Woodley, where you get hit by a bus? Well, yeah, yep, yep. That did, was. Did, did did you get hit by a bus? Well, I've just recovered. Um, I've, I've been in a coma for 20 years. Um, but, that, but that's, that's one of those things that was just trick photography. I don't know how they did it, but you, you, you spent probably two hours trying to do it for real. And then back in, back in those days when, um, oh, S wasn't such a huge issue. Um, you, you tried something for, for two hours and then some camera assistant just steps forward and goes, you know, there's probably a simpler way of doing this that doesn't risk his life, um, and and then and then I think that's the way that's the way we ended up doing it. I think I think I think I jump in, and then they actually bring the bus in with a separate shot, and then join the shots together. I think I think that's how how they would do it. Can I can I share my favourite sight gag in films <laughs> ever? Can I just share oh, yeah. that with you? Sure, uh, absolutely. This, this is not so much a slapstick joke, but it's a really good visual joke in a film, and it's in A Fish Called Wanda. And you might remember when John Cleese as Archie Leach first first meets Wanda, Jamie Lee Curtis, and he's uh, walking from his barrister's chambers to his car, and she calls to him, and he turns, and. Uh, you don't see him put his briefcase on the roof of the car, but you kind of know that that's what he's done as he's opening the door. And they have a conversation, and he's clearly besotted by her, and she wishes him well. She's conning him, but she wishes him well. And he leaves with this lingering look on his face as she walks away and gets into the car and drives off. And it's only as he drives off that it's revealed that he's left his bag on top of the car. And it drives off and turns right and leaves frame. And it's, a, it's the perfect... It's the perfect physical joke because it's it's just funny anyway, but it also re, it also comes out of the character and the story and everything. It's a, such a lovely piece of work, and that was of course a film uh, directed by Charles Crichton, who'd looked after a lot of those old Ealing comedies from the 1950s. And I think Cleese even says he was ancient when he shot Fish Called Wanda, so he must have been he must have been in his 70s at least when he when he shot that film, but. Then you fast forward to Fierce Creatures, which was uh, the follow-up that Cleese did with the same cast, and uh, Crichton didn't direct that, but there is nothing anywhere near that in terms of oh. movie joke-telling on film. And it's, it's, a, it's a much underrated film, Fish Called Wanda. I know people love it, but people, I don't think, realise just the excellent work that Crichton did in that film and how, uh, how much of a... Uh, a legacy he's left behind with a lot of the uh, the old Ealing comedies as well. I wondered what thinking about those kind of classic the moments of, of of kind of vehicular comedy. Takeshi Kitano. I don't know if you ever watch any of uh, his movies. Beat Takeshi, who is a, a, a Japanese actor and comedian and writer and director. He was in Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, and he's this incredible thing that in Japan he was kind of a mainstream comedy icon, but then made these beautiful, very serious at times, very melancholy ruminations on kind of being yakuza and stuff. But he always has great gags in it. So he does the man walks into a lamppost gag but with two idiots on a moped and that's just you know upping the ante to change it into an accident <laughs> at that kind of speed is a wonderful you know it's kind of it's, it's an old joke then reinvented with an extra level of pain yeah there's a wonderful gag buster keaton gag which uh, uh stays in my memory i can't remember which film it's from but he he it's very dark because he wants to commit suicide he i think he's been spurned by his girlfriend and he it's at night and he goes out onto the road as a car's approaching and he's going to be hit by the car. And then as the, as the car approaches, the headlights, we realise, are on two motorbikes and they just, they just drive around him. And he's got his eyes closed, so he doesn't, and he, he doesn't quite know how he's missed out being killed by the car. Is that the one where he ends up... It's the girl he's in, in love with uh, then nearly drowns and he saves her life. But she's unconscious at that time, and he doesn't and uh, uh, doesn't realise that he's I done can't that. Re 
It's one of the most the melancholy ones, definitely. It's the nearest yeah. to Beckett, I think. Well, it comes out of um, – I, I actually saw that gag in a compilation well, – in an anthology uh, documentary series that Lindsay Anderson hosted called um, uh, A Hard Act to Follow, I think it was. It's, it's a, if, if people don't know Buster Keaton's work uh, in intimate detail and they want to have a sampler of it, I would recommend A Hard Act to Follow, which is a three-part series. It was made by the same, same people who made Unknown Chaplin, which had a lot of outtakes of Chaplin's films. It's, it's quite excellent. And I wanted to, uh, uh, interesting, Colin, you mentioned Kenny Everett. And I think Kenny yeah. Everett, again, in terms of people who I don't think necessarily get enough kudos, Kenny Everett had something, I, I, I can't think of a more lovable comedian. There was something to me about the way, the, 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 the wonderful silliness of it. But he was, you know, he was called Cuddly Ken, but it really did come across that you're watching him and Billy Connolly corpse together, or normally Billy Connolly corpse while Kenny Everett kept a straight face, is one, uh, it, it, it just, again, the, 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 the excitement of watching that as a kid was delightful. Yeah, and, and, some, and sometimes as you recall when you're watching those programs, at the time when you're a child or an 11, 12 or early teenager, I don't know. I don't know whether I laughed that much, or you ac you actually just looked at these shows and you kind of just went. <laughs> you, 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 that 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 was that that was the reaction you did. And then when he comes out and does brotherly love, brotherly love with the with the big hands, and and then hot gossip would come on, and you just go, "What the hell is this show?" And and you, and I, I guess you're right. It is it is extremely uh, underrated, but it's I guess that's also to do with his charm and like the charm of the goodies in particular as well. You, I mean, Graham Garden, I mean, people argue about who their favourite was, but I think in some ways Graham Garden was my favourite because you see this little, you see this little twinkle in their eye that they're actually having a, a good time making it. And, and I think that's with Kenny Everett as well. You could see this little twinkle or this little kind of smirk or little look in their eyes where you could see that, he was having a fabulous time while he was making it. And I was going to ask you, Sean, and Robin as well, like Jacques Tati is, I think he's a polarizer when it comes to perhaps fans of physical com comedy, because with Jacques Tati, he, you don't, he doesn't, he doesn't have a twinkle in his eye. I mean, he's a very serious, um, you know, profoundly, you know, rehearsed and subtle physical comedian so i'm just yeah well often the camera's the camera's too far away with jacques tati to see the twinkle in his eye but, but i must admit that's what i loved about the films my father used to take me to the we had a beautiful old art deco cinema and one of my my fondest memories of my father taking me to see jacques tati films uh, which i couldn't share with my school friends because none of them knew who he was but yeah. um but i think the thing I really liked about it is that you got to work out what you wanted to look at on the screen uh, and enjoy what joke you chose to look at because there were often a number going on at the same time and the shots were often so wide that you would actually have, have to do a bit of work as an audience member to work out what it was in the scene that was odd. You knew, you knew because you trusted him that there was something funny going on, but you had to actually do a bit of work, whereas the Hollywood product, which I enjoyed as well, but it was often cut up into more easily digestible pieces and put on your fork and into your mouth. So, for example, if you were, if you like physical comedy, you could get that version from Jacques Tati, but then you could also sit down on a Saturday afternoon and watch uh, uh, Jerry Lewis uh, trip and fall into a pyramid of cans in a supermarket. I think that's the only place that cans were ever uh, displayed in that way, in the form of a pyramid, <laughs> would be in Jerry Lewis films from the 1960s. And Norman Wisdom was also somebody I enjoyed watching, and he kind of felt like he was in the same camp as Jerry Lewis, but I think he was a good 10 years older. But and another great scene uh, from the film The Early Bird, if you watch The Early Bird, where he's the milkman, and it opens this Ron Goodwin music all the way through it. It's just the opening title sequence, but it's six minutes long. It's entirely in pantomime, and it's about a whole bunch of people waking up and making a cup of tea in the house. And... I think it ends with Norman falling down the stairs with a cup of tea and it doesn't spill at all. 
And he mm. does that joke for real. That is actually him falling down the stairs, whereas, you know, Jerry Lewis would probably get a stunt man in to do the cutaway and the fall. But Norman, God bless him, would actually do the... And from a number of angles, so he's obviously done it a few times. <laughs> he's done it a few times, falling down those stairs. Uh, they, were, they were a delight, those films. I, what I love about those characters as well is the fact that people like Norman Wisdom and also George Formby were so popular in communist nations where you would find out that, you know, so Norman Wisdom in quite a few of them, again, because of playing the little man against big yeah. bureaucracy. And then I think George Formby, I'm right in saying, was given the Order of Lenin by Stalin. And there's something very strange when you think of the terrible crimes committed by Stalin that then he'd be like, come along and see me riding in the TT races. <laughs> you know, that is, a very, that's when and comedy almost goes, is the, is the meeting between comedy and despotism, is there ultimately a terrible evil at the heart of us all? That's fine. I, that's, it's strange, isn't it? I can understand why the people might well adopt uh, the, uh, George Formby or, or Norman Wisdom. In fact, I think in, I think the, uh, in Albania, I think uh, Norman Wisdom was at his most popular. And there's a statue of Norman Wisdom a life-size statue of him in the, in the, the town square in the, in the capital of Albania. But uh, the, the dictators who ran those countries, I think, co-opted the, uh, uh, the people's love of those characters. I think that's probably what happened. Yeah, I think so, I, I, I don't ruin it for me. Let me imagine that <laughs> Stalin every night would make people watch Let, watch Let George Do It. Um, thank you so I'm sorry we haven't been able to have as long a conversation as was planned, but I would like to thank you both for hanging around during the, the technical collapse that, that, that we had. And, uh, and can I ask you as well, where should people find out about what, what are the latest things? Colin, what, what are you up to at the moment? Well, we've we've uh, come out of some kind of lockdown in um, in Australia, so we're starting to do shows. Lan and Woodley are doing shows in the next couple of months, and um, we're very much looking forward forward to, to, to doing some uh, stupidness on stage, uh, where um, where we'll sing some songs, and uh, Frank will generally uh, shit me as much as he can. That's what to people hilarious need effect, now. Hopefully. It's what it's yes, that's what we required. need now. Hopefully, so so we're we're hoping that people are so desperate to see us that you know we don't actually have to do as quality work because their expectations will be lowered. It's an interesting and thing, isn't it? I think. Robin Williams used to talk about that. He said, you know, when you come and play London, there are five minutes free time that you get where people go, oh, look, brilliant, it's Robin Williams. But then after the <laughs> sixth minute, it's like, yeah, yeah, do something now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's... do something funny now. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for having us, Robin. I really appreciate it. It was great fun. Thank well, you. Well, I hope we Sean, can do it. I'd love to have a longer yourself? conversation. Sean, what are you up to? Uh, well, Robin, I'm, I'm obviously finishing my lozenge because it was only a short conversation. Uh, I've also got a – we've also got a Christmas special uh, – or we call it a pagan holiday special on the ABC. It'll be geo-blocked to most of your viewers, but I, uh, I mention it for the Australian uh, uh, watchers of this program. Uh, so that's on the 20th of December, uh, uh, which is next Sunday at 8.35. You've got to remember that a lot of people watching this are very scientifically minded. No geo block will stop them. Oh, okay. They will find some technique or other. Thank you so much, Colin and Sean. Uh, and okay. it was great. It's just, they are both uh, such knowledgeable people. It's lovely to have them. Uh, now, I, uh, this is the interesting bit because the running order means nothing to me now. So in terms of what's going to happen next, uh, etc., I will require instructions. Uh, so whoever is, uh, is listening out there, uh, I have a running order. I, I do know, by the way, uh, I would apologize for, for the fact that uh, because of everything that's gone wrong, uh, we're not able to have um, Eric Idle uh, today. Um, but Eric, hopefully... We've already decided, because the stuff that we had to bump, etc., that we are um, going to do next weekend, because this wasn't enough. We're not going to do a 24-hour one, uh, but I think next weekend, keep an eye on it, but we're probably going to try and do uh, a kind of four or five or maybe six-hour uh, thing uh, and uh, with, with some of the things that you haven't seen and with some of the guests that we, we had to kind of bump. Uh, and uh, I've just got to take a, a message. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 it's all right. I heard. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for watching. Thank you very much to everyone who supports us via Patreon. If you are able to support us via Patreon, that would be fantastic. We are the Cosmic Shambles Network. Uh, go to patreon.com, and uh, that means we can still keep making all the different things that we do now, including a, a, a new series of conversations with uh, scientists, authors, and performers about the meaning of existence. On top of that, book shambles. On top of that, our Sunday Science Q&A, and uh, also our um, Uncanny Hour documentary series as well. There's probably another one apart from that. I must have 
must have slipped my mind. But anyway, keep supporting us via Patreon. Keep supporting us via. Keep, we'll keep that in, by the way. We're not going to cut that because it's so real, isn't it? You can keep supporting us. I haven't really fully recovered, to be honest, from the uh, staying awake for 30 hours. I think it may well have damaged more neurons than I imagined. Anyway, thanks for all the support. Thank you. It's thanks to your support I was able to damage my brain as much as I have. Keep giving your money to patreon.com to support us and eventually there'll be almost nothing left lucky people